Well, you can certainly see the anger and humiliation on the part of the Kremlin, certainly also on the part of the Russian authorities as well. It's quite interesting because the spokesman for Vladimir Putin, Dmitry Peskov, he came out earlier today and tried to blame the Ukrainians for this. As you mentioned, these were Russian nationals going into Russia uh, and doing this. But the, uh, uh, the spokesman for the Kremlin there saying that he believed that these were Ukrainian nationalists. And he said that it shows that Russia is under attack from Ukraine. So the Russians obviously using this to justify their war in Ukraine, which has been going on, of course, uh, for over a year already. As you mentioned, the Ukrainians, for their part, completely denying that they had any part in this. In fact, earlier today, I was able to speak to the national security advisor of Ukraine, and here's what he told me. There is a part of Russians who are on the side of light and who went to deal with the darkness that exists in Russia now. What are the questions to us? I don't understand at all. So, uh, as we see, uh, the National Security Advisor is saying they had no part uh, in this at all. But one of the big questions, of course, now is what happens next? Is there going to be some sort of massive retaliations after this humiliation by the Russians? For instance, another big Russian missile attack. I asked the National Security Advisor that as well. And he said, look, the Russians have already attacked us with so many missiles. What are they going to do now? The Ukrainians, of course, also believe that they are prepared for any sort of further missile attacks that could come. On the Russian side, there are some questions that are being asked by the Russian authorities and by people on the ground there asking why the Russian army, which allegedly is so strong, was not able to protect the border. Boris. Yeah, an, an important question there. Fred Plykin from Kyiv, Ukraine, thank you so much. Uh, and Brianna, this is especially significant because the Ukrainian counteroffensive is looming and you have this attack on Russian soil. Yeah, that certainly plays into it. And we have retired U.S. Army Brigadier General Steve Anderson to talk to us a little bit about that. What do you see as the strategy for what we've seen here in Belgorod? Well, Bri Brianna, what this was was essentially a raid. I mean, think of Jeb Stewart in the Civil War running around the countryside in Virginia. These are essentially Russian sympathizers with the Ukrainians that have just raised some hell. They've got nine armored vehicles. They drove up about five kilometers into Russia. And what they've done is they've created a lot of havoc. And you've seen all the traffic, all the denials, and all the issues. They're, they're putting the pressure on Putin. They're showing that the Ukrainians are strong and resilient. And they're giving a very needed shot in the arm of the Ukrainians who are having a tough time now down in Bakhmut. What does it do to pulling some resources, uh, Russian resources, away as this counteroffensive is underway? Well, that's what the purpose of a raid would be, would require the Russians to pull troops out of perhaps down in the Bakhmut area where they have like 200,000 troops now uh, in, in the occupied areas in the Donbass. Now they've got to think about defending their homeland and they've got to pull some troops out, bring them back into Russia. And so that's a, that's a great operational victory for the Ukrainians. Can you talk to us about some of the shaping operations that you were seeing and what that means uh, during this counteroffensive? Yeah, so what they're trying to do is they're trying to prep for a counteroffensive. And the way they're doing it right now is they're doing intelligence prep of the battlefield on this 600-mile front right here. But they're also using high Mars and long-range artillery to strike the logistics nubs and the, the hubs in the rear, the headquarters facilities, et cetera, they're trying to shape the battlefield, trying to prep for, find out where the Russians are weakest so they can la launch some kind of a counteroffensive. Talk to us also about these F-16s. Obviously, we've heard a lot about them. Ukraine has been asking for them and asking for them. European allies say the Ukrainian fighter pilots are already training on these. Uh, we are expecting these are going to be supplied by European allies with the blessing of the U.S. Is it a game changer, though? It's not a game changer, but it is a very strong strategic message. It's showing, once again, the U.S. and NATO is behind the Ukrainians. They're not going away. And what they're trying to do is trying to help the Ukrainians conduct those deep strikes that I just talked about. This is a very capable aircraft. Um, it's a much better aircraft than the MiG-29. It, it operates better, faster, and, and sustains this is itself the MiG. longer. This is the inside of the MiG. Right. And if you compare this to the F-16, you'll see that the visibility in F-16 is much better, much better. So it's a better aircraft. But it's been around since 1979. Guess what? That means maintenance. It's got maintenance requirements, and uh, the United States need to do something about that. Maintenance and repair parts. We need to put experts on the ground in Ukraine. We need to have American contractors from General Dynamics and others that are helping the Ukrainians sustain these aircraft. Because if they're going to win this offense, they're going to need a lot of logistics power, and they're going to need to have air coverage over the entire battlefield. Obviously, a huge reticence to do that. We see no indication that that is happening. General, thank you so much for taking us through this. We do appreciate it.